Hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of the Capital Mind podcast or video podcast. In today's episode, we're going to discuss the concept of FIRE, financial independence and retiring early. Uh, and to have this discussion, we've got two guests this time. We have, of course, Deepak Shinoy, the founder and CEO of Capital Mind. And joining us from across the city is Vishal Jain, the CEO of Zerodha Fund House. They both have many decades of experience in investing in financial services. So we thought this would be the perfect set of people to have for this discussion. So folks, we have some experience with the concept of FIRE. Uh, when we were starting out the Capital Mind PMS, we had built this calculator, this very painstaking calculator that would help you figure out how much money you needed to, say, retire early, go on travel, uh, maybe send your kids to college and, and other stuff. But it turned out that it was fairly useless for people who joined our PMS because they already had more than enough money for this and financial planning really wasn't part of this discussion. But in preparation for this episode, I spent some time on Reddit and on the internet, and I find out that same calculator has a bit of a second life in some subreddits where people are trying to figure out uh, how much money they need for well, various goals. But let's start with the concept of FIRE. And so folks, both of you, what do you think of it? What do you make of it? Um, is it? Is it a good goal for folks to have? I just wanted to get your perspectives. So maybe Deepak will start with you. Cool, well thanks Ray. It's been, you know, I mean, I, I know that we are talking about financial independence entirely as a concept that everybody wants to be. But I find that the financial independence part is very ex very uh, exciting uh, for various other reasons. But this retire early kind of tends to ruin the experience in a way. Uh, because then people plan to say, I want to get out of my job at this point. And therefore, uh, plan for it in a different way. It's almost like, uh, I literally hate what I'm doing, but I'm going to keep doing it until I reach a certain amount of money and then uh, I will stop. Versus uh, I just want to build this corpus that makes sure that I can live without having to depend on an income, which is what financial independence is. And then, uh, you know, build my, my financial life. One of the problems with the FIRE uh, thought process is everybody's like, I hate what I'm doing. I would rather be traveling the world and therefore I need enough money to FIRE. Then, but you can fire, travel the world while you're working. You can take a two-month sabbatical and do that. Uh, and traveling the world does not take so much money as that you would need, the crores you would need to uh, kind of build yourself as a financial independent person versus a trip around the world, maybe a few lakhs. And you know, you can build a few lakhs a lot easier than you can build a few crores. So uh, sometimes you muddle up what you really want to do as a temporary one-time thing. I wish I could work from a cafe in Italy wala concept to, uh, uh, you know, actually saying, listen, I have enough money that now I don't have to worry about money. I'm going to work because I want to, not because I have to. Uh, at least that's my thought. And I think, but, you know, saying fire sounds more exciting than saying fire. So I think that's why it goes, it goes bonkers. But what do you think? I mean, I, I mean, I know we all, we probably have uh, similar views on a concept, but there will always be some diverging paths somewhere. I'm, uh, I mean, agree with a lot of what you're saying, uh, uh, Deepak. Um, I think it should be financial independence work forever. I think that makes more sense to me. Um, to me, FIRE, I hear a lot of people talking about it today. Um, I personally find that concept pretty alien. Um, you know, keeping in mind that when we started our work life uh, way back in the middle of the 90s, I mean, just getting a job itself was your first target and that became um, a kind of thing to achieve. Um, I still remember in 96 when I passed out from my MBA, getting a finance job itself was a pain, keeping in mind that uh, the economy, keeping in mind where the economy was um, at that point of time and the fact that people are talking about FIRE today means that uh, well, youngsters in the economy have confidence about the country, right? Which means that the country has progressed a lot in the last 25 years, which gives them the confidence to be able to kind of talk about and think about financial uh, independence. Uh, when we started off, um, it was an alien concept to us. Uh, to me, uh, what has allowed me to carry on in life and reach uh, where I am is basically, I believe that you've got to have some passion in life, and I think that is what um, carries you in life and until you don't have that passion, how much of a money that you have in life uh, is not going to be enough. Um, I wish that life was um, as simple as an Excel work worksheet which you could kind of extrapolate and say that this is where I'm going to be, but that's not how it is because financial independence and life, um, 
it's, a, it's all a moving target. I mean, at different stages of your life, your needs and wants keep changing. Um, initially, when uh, you start off your work life, um, you're still trying to make ends meet. Um, you think about getting married, think about reaching senior management level, and then, uh, and then uh, maybe become the head of a company. Uh, your needs at that point of time change. Um, what your kids need at that point of time and where the economy is at that point of time is very different. And therefore, um, what you feel at that point of time is very different from what you started off, say, 20, 25 years back. Um, and therefore, my belief is that you got to have some passion in life which eggs you on. And uh, it's only that passion which will lead towards kind of um, happiness. You kept saying um, that uh, financial independence and retire early is more because I'm fed up of my job and I don't know what more to do. But I don't think that's the way you've got to look at it. You've got to look at it in terms of can I pick up some passion which helps me achieve financial independence on the way. Yeah, that's a, you know, I think if I may add to this, there's this social angle, right? A lot of people just want to get enough rich so that they can show off their wealth to other people. And they base their concept of independence or retiring early based on, oh, listen, I have this fancier car. Now, you might buy a car for uh, the driving comfort or the sitting comfort, um, you know, the music system, whatever it may have. That's using a car. But if I buy a car entirely to show it off to someone else, then I'm in that rat race forever, right? Because no matter what I do, somebody else will have a fancier car and I'll be like, oh, let me work a few more years to get this fancier car, fancier house, fancier, uh, you know. Oh, there is this new uh, uh, 7,000 rupee shirt when I'm only buying 3,000 rupee shirts. Uh, so why shouldn't I? I should get rich enough to be able to buy five a month. You know, that, 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 that thought process will never end. That is not retire early. That is never retire and never be financially independent. Uh, in the, I don't know what the opposite of fire is, water, there must be something, <laughs> so it must be whatever it is. But, uh, you know, I would say that that driving force for people uh, and that unfortunately becomes this passion. So if you tell, tell anybody, if I give you a lot of money, what would you do with it? Uh, the people who have passions will tell you that they want to follow their passions. They, they'll tell you that, oh, you know what, this is what I want to do. I want to set up a library in this place. I want to house a lot of books. I know libraries don't make money, but I want this library because I want to help uh, people inculcate the aspect of reading. And I'll do reading sessions, I'll do this. It's really something I'm passionate about. Oh, th then you know, okay, this money, this is a finite amount of money. This is not infinite amount of money. And you can, you can target that. But if you talk to a person and say, I give you a lot of money. Oh, you know what, I'll spend it. I'll buy these fancy clothes. I'll buy this, that. But you'll run out of that money very fast. So uh, if you don't have that passion, a uh, fire is a useless thing for you, like you said. But unfortunately, passion can't be bought. It has to be found, absorbed, you know, some way. And unless you have that click factor, and some people click after they're 55. Thankfully, uh, you know, I'm getting closer to that stage. So, but I, in a way, I have a lot of uh, ideas and passions, and therefore I have to choose among them. But uh, remember, even Ray Kroc, I think, started McDonald's when he was 55. Uh, he was a salesman for ice cream vending machines before that. KFC. Uh, KFC also. Captain Sanders, right? He started KFC, I think, in... Colonel in Sanders. Yes, Colonel yes. Sanders, yeah. He started KFC when he was 65. Th there you go. We, we still have some hope. So. <laughs> well, thank you two CEOs for telling everyone out there that uh, 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 fire is not a good concept for you. I'm sure it will be very well received by everyone in the internet who, who's advocating for this. But look, I think we're going to tackle all the things you said and maybe debate them a bit. Let's first tackle the part, the FI part, the financial independence part. And uh, I think Deepak will start with you. But everyone realizes that this is a difficult thing to achieve, right? So first, let's leave aside your, your judgment on whether this is worth doing or whether this is a good use of your time and energy. But if I want to achieve financial independence, which you've said is something that people should all try and achieve, how does one get there? Um, how much money do you need? What's the framework you would use to decide this? Actually, good point, because I think the framework has three. In my mind, it's like you always do this uh, hygiene uh, and then uh, retirement concept and then spending. So uh, it's important, all three are important. The hygiene part is simply your insurance and your emergency funds. The emergency funds, I tell everybody, listen, you go to an accident, you can't work, your boss throws you out of your job, what do you do? You're a girl, your manager does uh, something that sounds icky and then you need to leave, what do you do? You need that five or ten months of cash in your bank account. Uh, that allows you to survive while you look for another job and all that stuff. This is not financial independence, this is just hygiene. 
this is just simply saying I get 5 to 10 months to find my next gig and that 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 money is super important because uh, uh, it covers for uh, income that you would have otherwise had so it's 10 months of expenses uh, 5 to 10 months of expenses in in a time then you do your life and health insurance life is typically because you have uh, uh, you know dependents wife children parents uh, you that that need to be taken care of in case you don't have an income therefore you do that health is the other part which is like something happens to you so these are hygiene elements you save for that first and then you start targeting the retirement bits uh, the retirement bits i think to me it's like everybody looks at it as a multiple of income but i look at it as a multiple of expenses so i'm not trying to replace income i'm trying to meet expenses so if i'm looking at an expense of 1 lakh a month today that's 12 lakhs a month you can do the calculations roughly 5% inflation uh, over you know i want to last myself 30 or 40 years uh, you need about 30 times to 40 times your annual expenses today uh, in order to meet inflation uh, you know uh, and grow and uh, because inflation means your expenses keep going up but your returns as a percentage of that corpus will be roughly the same so every year at some point you will reach a point where you are going to go closer and closer to zero so you need maybe for every lakh a month that you spend uh, about 4 crores in corpus uh, at, at the end this sounds crazy but if you don't plan to retire too early that means you plan to retire at the age of 50 or 55 um, which means at the point of retirement you have no other income uh, uh, because you are following your passion then you may actually have a much smoother path to get there of the order of say 25 or 30 or 40,000 rupees a month rather than trying to get to 4 crores when you have only 5 years and you are thinking yeah, in 5 years I need to retire then you will do stupid things uh, uh, you know I won't I mean there are too many stupid things you can do but then you know it merits dissatisfaction more than anything else I think that's the game plan you should go by the other thing of course is to uh, you know, go raise a lot of money from using some AI concept that you just invented and hopefully even if it doesn't make money you will get a big chunk of a salary that up front so it's that's fine that is hopefully not financial advice <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more uh, maybe Lottery the tickets. old man saying that the young men are doing this but I think that's that those are interesting lottery tickets uh, it's worked Fair. out well for people so but I mean you may have a different view to it no I mean I agree with a lot of what you're saying in the sense that uh, uh, first thing medical insurance life insurance are the first two things that one needs to have the next question is then uh, in terms of uh, where do you invest money right um, I think what you have been talking about more uh, again and again is that there has got to be some discipline in what you're doing and I think therefore that word discipline is extremely important for you to kind of uh, reach to a point uh, uh, to a point that you want to at some point of time um, luckily we inherit um, an economy that's growing very well and I think in terms of financial independence that will ease out a lot of burden uh, for people unless you're being rash uh, about your investments. Um, I think the year say between 2000 to 2006 uh, that period of the markets that we saw it's a lot akin to what we're seeing at this point of time where anything that you picked up any stock or anything that you picked up seemed to do well um, and I think that also eggs you on to become a little more rash than you need to actually with your investments. Um, I think that one doesn't need to be rash in this kind of economy that we have where we see growth uh, you know happening for the next 10 to 20 years or so. A um, lot of people don't realize that even a simple way of investing can take you from a point A to a point B. Um, let's look at simple numbers, Let, let's look at something like a say nifty 50 right. Um, had you invested in the nifty 50 say in the year 2000 2001 even till today it's given you a 16 percent CAGR year after year year after year year after year um, think about what's happened in the last 14 15 years um, you've had an Iraq war you've had Y2K um, you've had the Asian crisis which came about you've had the financial crisis that came about uh, you had the taper tantrums in 2013 which happened um, you've had COVID you've had a debt crisis that happened somewhere in 2018 or so um, you've had maybe five government changes in the last uh, uh, so many years even despite that it's given you nearly 16 percent CAGR and therefore it's important that investors are not rash about their um, investments and I think 
just simple investing can also take you to a point of financial independence as long as uh, you know you're disciplined uh, uh, about it um, and therefore a mix uh, in terms of having the right kind of asset allocation whether it's a good mix of equity debt commodity um, that kind of mix depending on your needs uh, you know your risk taking ability and your requirement for money is something that somebody can kind of build and be disciplined about it i think that's very important in my opinion uh, sir, yeah, just to add, uh, or rather to ask a question, would you say that the person who is young, who has started saving younger, of course, uh, they start saving younger and therefore they have an advantage, but are the older people, uh, people who are past 30 or something like that, haven't really saved so much, uh, do they, are they permanently crippled, are they, uh, or rather, are they at such a bad disadvantage that they can't do anything or is that, do you feel that that's, because I keep feeling that sometimes people realize this a little bit down into their careers and then they're like, oh my God, we missed the whole thing and I can never fire now, you know. No, I think that's been the case for all of us, right? But I think uh, the length of period in the markets or, or any kind of investment is what gets you the return. Look at, uh, you know, simple guys like say Warren Buffett, he started investing when he's 11. Right. A lot of people sit back and think that it's his skill of investing that has got him to here. Yeah, that's been one thing, but it's also the length of investing that he's been there for. Um, and therefore, start early is the mantra. Um, and therefore, even our children, we should ensure that they start investing since, you know, right from maybe 10 years, 12 years or 15 years. We should not wait for that to happen. Um, the longer, you know, that you're there in the markets, uh, the more there is a chance for you to create higher wealth. Um, it's not as if the guys who are 30 or 40 years old, you know, have missed the boat. Uh, now is the best time to start, I would say. I'm sticking with the FI part, the financial independence part, and what you do with the money that you're saving. So uh, uh, both of you folks have uh, been investing for and, and looking at markets for so many decades. So what are the lessons or the learnings you have from looking at markets for so long? Uh, and one thing which keep com keeps coming to mind to me is, let's say, uh, I think Vishal, you've kept mentioning how we're, we're sort of now all fortunate to be part of an economy that's growing and we feel 10 years from now we'll all be richer than we are today. And something that keeps haunting me is, what if India goes through a phase like say Japan did, where the stock market, at least that Nikkei 225 wala uh, thing, seems to have just never recovered or for, took 30 years to recover. In that case, are all these calculations then just, just pointless and then you'll never hit your targets? So I think the question is around lessons from a couple of decades of investing and uh, do you need the economy to give you 16% returns on the Nifty to be able to hit financial independence? No, I think the only answer to your question is asset allocation. Um, at no given point of time do we know which asset class is going to do well, right? Um, I keep telling people, uh, whoever comes to me at this point of time, uh, the first question that comes, you know, Vishal Markis at the peak, is it the right time to mm -hmm. invest? Um, I would tend to think, yes, it's always the right time for you to invest, right? Uh, but how do you then uh, kind of negate that fear or lessen the fear? Uh, a simple addition to your portfolio could be something like gold, right? And why gold? Because gold has a very low correlation with equity, right? So if you, if you build an asset allocation with, say, equity, debt, gold, at some given point of time, you will always have some asset class that is working for you. Let's take a simple example that uh, markets are at the peak and, well, some untoward uh, incident happens in the economy which leads to a crash in the markets. The first thing that kind of cushions your portfolio is gold. So if you have about 15, 20% of gold, it kind of, you know, it kind of cushions your portfolio. Um, what it also helps you to do is a lot of times we're 100% invested in the market. And when the markets crash, we don't have money to, you know, add to that investment. Something like an asset class which is shot up at that point of time, you could always sell that and kind of retweak your portfolio and pump that back into equity, right? And therefore, that's how an asset allocation helps. I think instead of sitting there and trying to find the right fund manager, the right stock, the right sector all the time, um, spend time building the right kind of asset allocation for yourself. A simple thing could be, 50% equity, 25% debt, 25% gold is something that someone can start with and then kind of tweak your way around, uh, you know, in terms of what makes you feel good. Uh, if I could add one more question to this, since, uh, I mean, so far, uh, the Zero the Fund House has mostly focused on passive investments. Do you think that you could potentially achieve all your fire targets, as you've said, with sensible asset allocation and just passive? Do you think that would work as well? Uh, that's, that's the whole objective because at this point of time, 
um, for us, the main objective is that how do you get a lot of the small guys who don't have access to financial products, how do you get them coming into, um, say, financial inclusion uh, in that sense? And our belief is that uh, it's only simple products that will help more and more people to start investing uh, in the markets and benefit from uh, uh, you know, the markets and different asset classes that are there and help define better financial outcomes for themselves. And that's the main objective, basically. Deepak, you hate all things that start with gold or real estate or something. So how do you react to this? That's a good point. I mean, though I think real estate is not a great investment. I think it's a great thing to live in, use. It's like a car and all that. So uh, it's a useful expenditure, but it's not great as an investment. Not because of anything else, but because it's so much of a pain to maintain. I've had personal bad experiences and so on. Gold, um, I don't think it's a great investment. One of the reasons, I mean, of course, it is a great time to hold it when markets are crashing because it helps. Uh, the unfortunate problem that we have is that we never look at our investing lives in a holistic way. So is there a number? Yes, that you have to look at to get there, right? But you never look at your investing lives in that sense. You say, I have 5 lakhs in equity, 4 lakhs in gold, 3 lakhs in something else, uh, FDs. But you don't say, I have 12 lakhs. And that 12 lakhs has grown by, uh, say, 5%. You say, oh, my 5 lakhs in equity has doubled. So you're thinking of it like that. But on a 12 lakh, it's not double. It's like 12 lakhs has become 17. It's actually a, I don't know, 40% return. It's a very good return. But you don't think of it that way. Because that's the reason why uh, at the times when life is bad, you're not thinking, oh, at least I have 4 lakhs of gold and 3 lakhs of FD and that's cushioned me. It's that my 5 lakhs of equity has fallen to 2.5 lakhs. And that's making me miserable because I've fallen 50%. But I've only fallen 50% on that. I've actually fallen only 10% on my overall, 12% or 20% on my overall uh, portfolio allocation, which is much lesser. The markets may have fallen 50%. I've fallen only 20%. I don't get that. So uh, it's impossible for us because once you've desegregated all of these things, uh, then you look inside also. So within equity, I may have an equity allocation to passive. I might have bought a few stocks. I might have bought a few other mutual funds. And then I look at the one that's worse performing and that's going to hurt me the most. So I keep looking and saying, why did I get into that? And uh, you know, that's a very bad idea. Oh, I, you know what? Uh, the markets are looking like, uh, they're looking very hot. And I got this question, by the way, in December or January of, December of last year, January of 2024, markets hit at an all-time high. And we were asked, should we get out? Should I re rebalance and move my money to say gold or real estate or, or something like that? And I was like, I don't know because I don't know the answer to what happens. Uh, and then I don't know the answer to what happens and then how the market will react to it. So then it, you know, it came to elections and then uh, people said uh, the markets are overvalued. Uh, I said, yes, maybe, but I don't know how much more overvalued it will get. And they said, no, no, but what about the elections? If the government loses the election, you, well, the government didn't do as well in the elections, uh, it turned out. And then the markets reacted one day negatively, 15 days so positively that the market was up 20% since then, uh, since the bottom. So it's like, okay, I couldn't have predicted that, even if I had. So if I had made these decisions thinking that I'm going to now actively manage it on a micro basis, I think on a global basis, once a year, yes, it makes sense. Oh, I have too much equity. Let me just reduce it a little bit. But if you make these decisions based on, oh, the, you know, the market's overvalued because it's gone up the last one year, then people tend to make the wrong kind of decisions. And that quality of decision making is complicated by the fact that when we get it wrong, we feel even more miserable getting it wrong. So if you had an investment, it fell, you could say, okay, well, you know, it fell. But if I actively moved my money out of that investment and it went up, now you feel like, dude, I was there. And I walked away right at the time when it went up 25 or 30%. I hate this market. It's all rigged. They only, these big people make all the money. They only tell us the market is going to go down and it goes up. So this is the, uh, you know, even the big people, whoever these big people are, they also don't know that the market is going up. Sometimes they're just lucky to have stayed invested. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the biggest, the best investors in the market are dead, right? So because, you know, nobody ever made their decisions and they just kept going up. Uh, so the, the a aspect of this asset allocation point of view, I think sometimes goes into this, you need to stop yourself from making too many actions and just stay invested. 
and you know you need to hold on to those winners because whether it's a stock it's a True. mutual fund it's a passive fund uh, you cannot predict the madness of markets True. and uh, e even worse you will say there's a ukraine war you could have predicted the ukraine war successfully you could have gotten out before the ukraine war and you would have probably lost money uh, like somebody recently said uh, if you had taken the us market for the last two years and somebody had told you that there would be a Silicon Valley bank going down, there would be an uh, increase in interest rates, there would be a bet that four uh, rate cuts would come and zero rate cuts have come so far and uh, 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 an inflation would remain sticky. And you could have made all of these predictions and still got the market entirely wrong. So for instance, a person who is thinking that the rate cuts will not come would have taken his money out of the market rate cuts didn't come. The S&P 500 is up 50 percent. So the fact that you're a good predictor of an economic event has no impact on are you a good predictor of the markets itself. So given that, that we are all you know victims of over uh, predictions and uh, you know we don't analyze our predictive abilities back so far enough to understand that a lot of this is just going to be luck or uh, a change of things that simply doesn't happen. I think we'll, we should reduce our decision making to the point where we say, well, you know what, I have five buckets and one is too full, it's over full with water. I need to move water from that bucket to some other bucket. That's the decision you want to make. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, whether that water is going to overflow more tomorrow, all of that stuff is just beyond our you know pay grades in a way. No, I agree with what you're saying. I think one thing I just... Uh I think uh, I can add over there is, again, bringing the simplicity aspect um, of your DMAT account. Uh, you know, as you said that when my equity goes down, I only see my equity has gone down, my gold is somewhere yeah. else. Um, I think one way to kind of simplify the in entire investing experience is to have, you know, very few number of investments in your DMAT account. Um, and uh, kind of that makes it easy for you to kind of mix and match or tweak your portfolio, you know, whenever you want to. Um, again, when I was talking about gold, uh, I was speaking more about using a financial asset linked to a gold, whether it's a sovereign gold bond or a gold ETF or any kind of gold fund or fund to add to your portfolio to kind of cushion it in case uh, there is a fall in the market. Uh, to me, all throughout my life, I've had just four or five DMAT entries in my whole account. And anything more than that, I find it difficult to manage. So I think what you're saying is having those five simple buckets is important. Um, and I think uh, uh, that's one of the biggest learnings I've had in the markets uh, over the last 20 years, yeah. So if you folks are okay with it, I'd now like to tackle the RE part, the retire early part. Now, you've already made your initial thoughts kind of clear. Vishal, you've talked about how having a passion is probably what will get you through life. And Deepak, you've mentioned that don't just let dissatisfaction with the status quo uh, make you fantasize about like escaping it all. I mean, come up with some solution to the thing in the first place. So let me start with the obvious criticism that's going to be leveled in there, which is that, look, you both run your own companies. Uh, uh, so in the sense, the, 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 the appeal of RE is really not for both of you because you're already top of the uh, pack over here. But let me ask it a little differently. If you were to look at people who are like, look, this isn't going great. Modern, modern jobs require too much of your time. These are very demanding. I don't know if I can take two months off to go travel the world. It'll have to be in between jobs or something like that. Uh, how would you help people figure out how uh, uh, they can make their jobs more interesting for themselves? And uh, I think both of you have been entrepreneurs. Deepak is one right now as well. And Vishal, you have been one in the past. Do you think that a lot of the distinction lies in doing a job versus doing your own business or doing your own thing? Will your satisfaction levels automatically spike up when it comes to taking charge of a project and doing it uh, uh, rather than working for someone else? Maybe Devko, we'll start with so, you since you've probably never worked for anyone else. I, I have a horrible resume that way. Mostly my employer has been me. Uh, but to that extent, I don't think uh, being uh, a founder has any less uh, of a challenge because honestly, you can always blame your boss for some of the bad decisions that have happened uh, when you're working. But when you're the founder, you don't have a boss. There's nobody else to blame. It's just you, right? You're going to have to take the blame for every bad thing that happens. And sometimes that can be extremely, um, well, when things are going really badly, it can have an extremely bad mental effect on your life. But um, uh, the satisfaction on the upside is similarly high, uh, higher because you then, you've, you know that you've, it's been partly at least your achievements that have kind of made it. 
but um, on the passion front, I think the retire early concept has. So I was watching this you know, uh, series of videos on on Twitter by this guy, and he talks about why he did this. And it's a very interesting thing. He, he's he's a uh, I think he's an American person living in Bangkok um, or Thailand, and he has this little property on which he res where he rescues stray dogs, uh, dogs that have been you know. So the um, the, the videos that he takes, I mean, he, he runs them over a period of time, rescues them, fixes them up, uh, and then offers them for uh, uh, adoption, uh, both locally and internationally. And people kind of, kind of documents their journey. This is his life. Uh, this is what he does. But he does this not because he wants to do. It's not only because it's his passion. He's found that this helps him with his depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. because he has that. Uh, he's f found that as a problem, and that. Everything else that he did drove him to say liquor or something like that, and uh, this was something that he was able to kind of move away from that entire thing and find as a passion. If this is what you find that you want to do, uh, you're going to need either the finances to be able to manage something like this uh, by yourself. And though while he's putting this all on Twitter, and almost nothing of it, this is financial, right? So he's just putting this as information to tell the world. Uh, so he's not actually making a business out of this stuff. So it's not like this is going to earn him a lot of income, but he's doing it primarily for his passion. To do something like this, uh, which a lot of which is possible in India as well, you're going to need that financial independence money to be larger than just your expenses because you're going to have doc taking care of expenses, fixing vaccinations, etc., 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 which add on to this. So uh, that is a different kind of corpus that is required. Whereas this passion finding when you're on a, many people find it sometime along the way. I really want to do this. I really want to do theater, for instance. But you could do theater alongside your job. It may not. Your if you're if you're of course if you're in a job that requires you to work 16 hours a day, probably not. But if you find a job that allows you to work a little bit less, then you could take your passions alongside. There are people who do sports. There are people who have health. They can all of these uh, aspirations can be done alongside your job. This may actually f help you find happiness. Uh, a little before you actually get into financial independence. So in the sense that you've semi found that thing that you want to do and then there will be a point of switch over when you say well I want to do this full time. It could be uh, setting up a business in the area that you're passionate about where you're not actually retiring. The business can actually earn a lot of money but you're not going to be on the road if the business doesn't uh, do well. So you know that is a kind of I think eventually aspirational space that all of us want to lead ourselves into because we still want to be useful when we retire in the sense we want to be no you you don't want to do something that you don't find satisfaction in and you're not even charging another person meaningfully enough for instance some people come and said i will become i hate to use this word a startup advisor because they have enough money that they've retired in the problem with that is you're neither doing the startup and you may not even be charging meaningfully enough for that advice uh, because they're startups, they don't have enough money in the first place. So you're either you're neither getting meaning out of it for yourself, uh, nor are you getting money enough for it for yourself. Then you find out that, dude, this retire only doesn't work for me because in the end you want to find meaning for yourself. So this that part of it, I think, is, is a more nuanced approach. I think that, see, it depends a lot on an individual in the sense that should you be an entrepreneur or should you work for somebody, I think, it all depends on what you are cut out for in life. If you remember, uh, we were talking a while back, Deepak, when you said that uh, uh, for you, a monthly salary is alien. And, and it's something that because you've been an entrepreneur all throughout your life, um, to you, it's something that you've just gotten used to in life. Uh, well, for a person like me who's uh, been an entrepreneur for a short period of my life, and when I, when I mean entrepreneur, where I actually got out and started a company by myself, um, I still find a lot of satisfaction in terms of getting a monthly salary coming into my account. Um, I think what's important as an individual is not, I think being an entrepreneur or being a salaried person, I think what is it that you do towards um, getting yourself out of the comfort zone? Um, and I think as an individual, I think that's very important. So you see so many guys who've been working all throughout your life, right, from guys like, say, Satya Nadella, who's been working and it become successful, to a guy like, say, an Elon Musk, who's been an entrepreneur all his life and done well as well, right? Um, I think what's important is what you do as an individual to get yourself 
out of the comfort zone because once you get yourself out of the comfort zone, um, that is when you start learning as an individual um, and that is when uh, you kind of mature as a person um, and move ahead as a person, um, I would tend to think. Um, I got out of my work life and started a venture by myself uh, way back in 2014, uh, which was completely different from what I had done. Um, it was in the juice space and that venture kind of failed in a span of about two or three years. Um, went through a bad phase uh, mentally and I get people asking me all the time in terms of, will you do that again? Um, and what according to you, uh, you know, is the change that has happened? I think one big thing uh, that I think a person, uh, you know, needs to, uh, well, succeed in life um, is, is, is what you call as uh, resilience, right? The strength to keep changing, the strength to keep carrying on amidst, uh, you know, a bad event that happens in your life. And I think that's something that every individual needs to keep exposing themselves to. And that's what I mean in terms of um, getting out there and coming out of your comfort zone. Because it's that res resilience that will kind of mature you as an individual and uh, you know, keep uh, you know you can keep doing more and more things in your life. Um, when I kind of closed that venture and came back to the corporate field, I could feel that I've maybe grown five, seven years ahead of what others had. Um, uh, you know, who were also working with me at that point of time. It's something I didn't understand at that point of time. But the more I think about it, I realize that I kind of got a fill up in my life um, in terms of that resilience bit because. When you have uh, you know, an untoward or a difficult situation coming in front of you, you're able to manage it much better than somebody else who's not been exposed to it. Um, so yes, I think that um, if, if somebody asks me, Vishal, will you do it again? Yes, I will do it again. Um, this time, I'm far smarter than what I was. Um, once, uh, hopefully, maybe in the next seven to eight years, uh, once Zero the Fund House reaches a certain level, um, I'm definitely going to get back out and uh, become an entrepreneur again. Um, and I'm sure this time I won't fail. Okay, so, well, I guess it's not really about whether it's a job uh, or uh, whether it's entrepreneurship. So let's maybe abstract this out a bit. Let's say that you're going to spend a couple of decades doing something in your career. It's going to be a mix of maybe working for other people, doing your own projects, uh, maybe some consulting, but whatever it might be, uh, based on your own experiences, maybe both in your own careers, people you've seen in your firms who've done very well for themselves, uh, maybe your own peers, who, people who managed to do well. What advice do you have on, I guess we could call it skills, tactics, or anything, frankly, that you could share with people? Because it seems that it's unlikely that you'll achieve FI without really killing it and doing a great job in your career as well, right? So maybe Deepak, Deepak we can start with you. Yeah, so I think, you know, Shrey, we had this, uh, like, and also Vishal, I think the idea here has been uh, for me that it's also not just the core skills that you develop anymore. And maybe it's not been for the last 20 years. Uh, uh, I don't know much more than that because I've been in the workforce since 1996, so about nearly 30 years. But one of the things I've found is you need to be really good at something. But you also need the world around you to know that you're really good at that something. Because otherwise, uh, there are always people who take credit for stuff that they don't know how to do. If you know how to do something well, you should be getting the credit for that. And I'll tell you why, where I'm going with this. It's a very diffi difficult skill to build communication, uh, to communicate with other people. But sometimes you have to communicate with other people simply just for them to let to, to know uh, how deep your knowledge is or your thought process is in something. And uh, I, take, I took on to, for instance, when I was doing an earlier uh, job on a, on a strange language called Delphi. Uh, I decided that, yeah, we can be really good at Delphi. But how would people know that you're really good at Delphi? That you have to help other people when they have problems uh, doing something in Delphi, saying, this is me, I'm going to write about it, I'm going to show them the code, and then they're going to know that I'm good, I'm, I'm good at that stuff. Uh, strangely, in that world, it started to work because you, uh, from India, if you're doing this language, it's like relatively unknown that somebody outside of the US is doing it and you know, uh, you got a little bit of fame, a little bit of uh, uh, entry points there. But now I'm not just saying for the whole world, sometimes within your company, within your, even if you're in a, a career bureaucrat, you've got to let your seniors know that 
what you are doing or about what you are doing and how you are doing it better than anybody else. The second part is to do things that uh, uh, are done in a certain way by even questioning the way they have been done in the past because there could be new ways to do the same thing in a much better way, manner. This requires a little bit of thinking out of the box, maybe looking at how other people have done things. For instance, in the asset management business, you did this Vishal. You started an ETF company when India didn't even have proper mutual funds. And you started a company that was passive and ETFs, which is like two layers of complexity. Once you're following an index and then you're appointing market makers to help you follow that index by putting their bids into the market at a time when people were like, excuse me, why are you making life so complicated? We have mutual funds where you call up and you say for sign a form and fill it and that's how you invest boss that's the because now of course things are much much better and there are more etfs now but this thinking outside the box and saying listen there was there is an established etf market perhaps abroad but it won't work as it is in india in india you're going to need little more complexity uh, little different thought process the uh, advantages that a us etf out up has are not as equivalent to an Indian ETF, but then India also ETF will make sense. This thought process itself is different. It's a whole different way to address. It. I think a lot of times in our jobs we come across these times when you have these inflection points. You're saying, no, no, this whole thing that we're doing right now is wrong. And when you know that, when you realize that, I think this is the time when you get to seize that opportunity and go out there and present what you are. You may fail, but you tried. And more to more times you learn more by trying those things, those off balance things uh, than you do by just being good at whatever you have been told to do uh, forever. Because I, Atul Chitnis said this, and I, you know, I remember him still, uh, uh, he says you are not known for doing what you are expected to have done. You are known for, for either beating it or doing something different. And uh, in the end, really, uh, it is this recognition that brings us both internal satisfaction and helps us in our careers because people will always remember that, hey, you know what, Deepak had said this, maybe he knows more about this, and an opportunity will come your way. I think that is my advice in general is to not just be good at what you do, but also do the prachar of it in, in that way uh, because nobody else is going to do it for you. And you should not be, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I want my work to speak for itself. Thank you, thank you. Leave that in the textbook. Your work is going to speak for itself to you. But you have to speak about it to everybody else. And uh, otherwise things don't work. Uh, so don't go, I mean, people now go around on Twitter trying to make a name for themselves by trolling other people. Because that's the only way they can feel they'll ever get famous because they're not, they're not really, they don't have any substance of their own. They'll go and say, Deepak, you're a uh, South Indian dirty fellow. So hoping that I react and then I, then they will get a little bit of fame saying Deepak or I block them and then they will get even more, uh, you know. But that is not meaning, right? Because you're not doing anything meaningful. If you find the meaning, you have to do the prachar. Because otherwise the trolls will take you. No, so I think to understand uh, uh, what you're trying to say is firstly, uh, is uh, how do I, well, become visible in an organization? Um, in a sense, how do I navigate, uh, should I say, the politics in the organization? Um, and secondly, it's important for me to have a moat in life, right? Which I agree with, uh, you know, both things that you're saying. Um, a moat is extremely important because that's something that will navigate your career through any bad phase. I mean, if you're a generalist, um, the chance of you Losing a job during a during a downward term is far higher than somebody who's got some um, expertise. And I think when I look back in my life, um, we started off with ETFs, as you said. Uh, maybe again and again, we were probably 15 years ahead of time. Uh, I mean, we got a technology into India which was just three or four years old. Well, the ETFs had got launched, it, uh, launched, I think, in 93 or 94. And I think within 2001, those products were already there in India. Was the Indian market ready for it? Um, obviously it wasn't. Uh, but they were the right kind of products to have in the market. If you look at it today, I mean, they've just flourished in the sense that they're nearly 17% of all AUMs uh, in the mutual fund industry. And therefore, I think it's, uh, when I look at my career, I think one of the things that um, has kind of, despite the fact that 
passive products um, didn't do too well for the first 15 years, but uh, we've still survived in the market um, and uh, the market is much more acceptable to the products and I think what has kept me alive in the market is the fact that I had a passion for these products um, and that I've gained a certain amount of expertise in those products at that point of time. So I agree with uh, you know both the things that you're saying in terms of having a moat and in terms of being there, uh, uh, you know, being out there, uh, you know, visible in the, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the corporate world in terms of uh, the word, uh, you know, what they say, what they don't teach at Harvard. Uh, but that's something that you can learn only once you're in the organization um, and navigate the organization. I think for a person to navigate the organization and to navigate their careers, extremely um, important to be open. It's extremely important uh, to understand what's happening in terms of environment and how you're going to navigate that environment. A lot of times I find people coming and saying that, look, I don't get any opportunities. A lot of times we are not open to those opportunities. And it's extremely important for us to be open to those opportunities all the time and to kind of change ourselves, uh, you know, to be able to kind of uh, use those opportunities and kind of, um, you know, extract those opportunities to our benefit, uh, you know, if I can use the word. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And now I'd like to end with something completely different, if that's okay. Um, since this is after all a Capital Mind episode, everyone wants to know something about money. So if you had to advise someone today, and I, maybe we can't use the word advice, but it'd be hard to opine on someone who had 100, 1 lakh, uh, or 10 lakh rupees today about, look, I really care about financial independence and maybe retiring early. Uh, how do I deploy this today? What would be your somewhat specific recommendations to the extent you're uh, comfortable talking about them? I mean, maybe don't name a stock, ideally. But uh, uh, other than that, how would you advise this? Whoever wants to take this first. No, I, I'll, uh, <laughs> no, for me, uh, okay. I'm completely opposite to what Deepak is. <laughs> so I would say that, um, I mean, I've mentioned uh, yeah. a lot of these points uh, during our conversation. Um, extremely important to be disciplined. Okay. Uh, don't need to be rash in the market. Um, I think asset allocation is very important. Um, and uh, you know, even within asset allocation, uh, follow a kind of core and satellite kind of an approach where uh, your core uh, becomes a very simple strategy which you can kind of mix your equity, debt and gold. Your satellite portion of your portfolio can be alternatives which could be an active fund or could be uh, you know an alternative asset that you look at, but keep a discipline in your portfolio um, and only play around with a certain portion of your portfolio once you do that. So if so, for example, if I had 100 rupees, I'd say that look, 75 rupees is something I'm not going to touch with. That's going to be broken up into asset allocation, and that split could be, as I said earlier, a 50 equity, 25 debt, and a 25. Uh, commodity kind of a thing and the rest 25 rupees is something that I can play around with. Maybe look at sectors which I believe um, are going to outperform or maybe look at some asset class which is going to outperform or pick up an active fund manager or a PMS or something like that um, you know in that portfolio where, where I believe that that particular asset class may kind of um, add to the returns of my core portfolio. Right? Um, have that discipline um, and maintain that discipline uh, you know, for a long period of time and I'm sure the FI part won't be too far away for people here. Yeah. Yeah, if 16% if, if uh, uh, CAGR is even remotely possible, I think FI will not be a problem yeah. for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so I would agree. Yes. Deepak, how about you? Please okay. don't say Bitcoin. No, yes, no, I will, I will, that's a very important point. I have a different uh, opinion on this. Maybe I, I'm, I'm going to give what is called global gyan nowadays, okay. which is uh, uh, the the smaller your corpus is, uh, the returns matter to you or the uh, asset allocation start to matter to you once your corpus becomes roughly three times your annual income or expenses. So basically if you are earning a lakh a month, then you need to be 36 lakhs in corpus before the mean returns become meaningful enough to you for you to bother about oh a 1% difference in return is going to be meaningful. After, up till that point, according to me, even an FD is fine and even uh, gold or, or a larger allocation to something that you don't consider optimal is also fine. But once you get to that point, you have to start, I think Vishal has given a great uh, sequence of optimizations where you can say, okay, I'll start with the passives uh, and I, I may be a passive person throughout and or I could then blend downwards into, I'll put a little bit of allocation to something else, something else, something else, which is uh, a different uh, a way to look at it. But uh, you need 
I think these things start to make sense once your corpus becomes slightly bigger. For the early part of career, and I tell this to a lot of people, we are asset managers. Ignore us because your biggest return is going to be you. So if that money can better spend taking a course which gives you a degree which can improve your life or uh, learning a new skill within your job or outside of your job that can get you a better return, uh, the salary increments that you might be able to get just on that is greater than the returns that you will get from any investment that you make with that money. So if I can get a 1 lakh rupee per month job today and that I can, I can take another skill that gives me a 1 lakh 50,000 rupees per month then spending that 10 lakhs on that skill uh, might pay for itself in much faster terms uh, than it is than the other way around. So I'm saying that just the 50,000 rupees extra per month is 6 lakhs rupees a year. Imagine 10 lakh rupees spent to get 6 lakhs extra a year would be 60% return on capital, right? So it's, it's always like you invest in yourself, it's better. The next set would be invest in a business that you control, that you control because you may be, it may be something that you, uh, so this is me coming from, I have done the maddest things. I didn't have any money and I put it invested, whatever I little I had into a business that I started. And it made me a reasonable amount of money in the end of uh, uh, that time. But it was a miserably difficult experience because the, I went through phases where I couldn't spend as much as my friends could. And then I came to a phase where I could spend a lot more than I, my friends could. But uh, I could control the business. That's why it's different. Because when you can control a business, you can have 90% of your wealth in that business. And that's fine. But once you get into other people's businesses, then you should definitely look at the approach that, uh, uh, that Vishal mentioned, which is diversify, build yourself a thought process around allocation, and then do it. This might, this is a, a sequence of events that I'll say everybody should go through. But usually people have already set in their lives. So they, there's not that much improvement to be made. This is the people who are 35, 30 plus and all that stuff. For people who are younger, the money actually makes sense doing things that will help you uh, traverse a future career path that may be significantly higher return than uh, uh, anything else by just doing an incremental course, a learning, a travel. A, I mean, how many of us would at a job say, listen, there's this fantastic uh, uh, conference and my company will not allow me to go for it because I'm not high enough or whatever, but I'll pay my way and I'll take a holiday from my company. I'll go and attend this conference and I'll come back and I'm going to meet the right kind of people over there. It's very difficult to find people who will actually do this because the minute they apply and say, the company says, no, sorry, you're not, you don't qualify to attend this conference. You're like, okay, it's over, bye-bye. It's, you know, that's, that's the end. But I think that may be a better investment of the money that you have than sometimes, you know, doing it at, at a younger age. It, it'll change as your corpus grows because incremental earnings won't come so much. So that's just more global because in the end I'm telling you to invest in yourself, build yourself better, do some 10 push-ups instead of five. But you know, uh, maybe sometimes 10 push-ups make sense. Thanks so much for listening. I hope this episode has given you some perspectives on how to achieve financial independence and think about how retire early works. Do listen in for next time.